New data from the Federal Reserve shows that Americans are wealthier than they have ever been. But if you've been living here on Earth and reading the news over the past few years, then it may not seem that way at all, which might cause you to question that statement from the Federal Reserve about everyone being so wealthy. Let me show you what I uncovered after reviewing this 50-page report and share with you what I think is missing from this thing. Net worth is naturally downstream of income, so it's a good place to start because it's a decent measure of how wealthy someone is since it takes all assets into account. The change in net worth was one that both surprised me and didn't at the same time. Here's why. The real median net worth increased by 37% to a little under $193,000. Now we'll talk about housing later in the video, but this wasn't a huge surprise to me because of that factor. What was a surprise to me was the change in real mean net worth during that same time frame. It only increased 23% to a little over $1 million. The reason this caught me off guard is because the mean does not remove those super wealthy outliers which could cause the number to be higher than the median. What this tells me is that the wealth gap between the wealthiest households and the middle slash lower income households from a net worth perspective has gotten small. Not by a ton and close to the same rate as the 2019 survey, but it seems like it's continuing to head in the right direction. Paying attention to the wealth gap is important because it tells us a few things. First, the health of the economy. A widening wealth gap can indicate that the economy is growing in a way that disproportionately benefits those at the top of the wealth spectrum. I have zero issue with people who have a high net worth and neither should you. But if there's a huge wealth gap, then the next thing you know, we're left with a bunch of rich people, a bunch of poor people, and barely anybody left in the middle. Second, it tells us about access to opportunities. A significant wealth gap often correlates with unequal access to education, healthcare, and other opportunities that can help individuals improve their economic standing. Equality of outcome is what we don't want. And I don't even think that we really want equality of opportunity either because everyone has different preferences. What I think we want is just opportunity. It's there if someone wants to take it, but if they don't, then they don't. Third, the wealth gap gives us an indication of economic mobility. A large wealth gap could make it more difficult for individuals to move out of their current economic class, particularly from lower to higher wealth brackets. You can almost think of it like the rungs on a ladder. If you start removing them one by one, beginning with the middle, then it eventually becomes nearly impossible to climb from the bottom all the way up to the top. When it comes to the wealth gap, we also have to keep in mind that there is always going to be a subset of the population that'll never move up the spectrum because they just don't have the desire to, or they don't want to put in the effort to do so. This might seem like a foreign concept to most of us, but I can confirm that I know people who are in this part of the population. You can give them all of the opportunity in the world, literally hold it right out there in front of them, but they're not interested. Doesn't make any sense to me, but they are out there. The Fed found that between 2019 and 2022, median debt has only increased by 7% to a little over $80,000. When we dig down into the details, we only saw slight increases with vehicle loans, a large increase with lines of credit not secured by property, and no increase with primary residences. While it's fun and interesting to look at the overall debt amounts, we need to take these numbers with a grain of salt since it's all relative based on things like assets and income. Because you've got to think, having $30,000 of car debt when you take home $100,000 per year is much worse than having that same amount of debt when you take home twice that amount. We'll talk about incomes in more detail in just a minute, but when we look at debt levels compared to income and assets, things aren't looking too bad. In fact, everything is down since the 2010 survey. The leverage ratio measures the amount of debt compared to asset values, which is is 29%. The debt to income ratio, which is the same as 2016, but still down since 2010. The payment to income ratio compares payments made on debt relative to income, which is of course down. Even the fraction with payment to income ratio greater than 40% is down. I know this probably doesn't line up with the narrative that we've all been fed about how everyone is borrowing more money to afford their current lifestyle, but these declining numbers paint a completely different picture. If net worth is at the bottom of the funnel because it tells us how how well you've done with your money up until this point. Income is at the top of the funnel since it is the lifeblood of your net worth. Median income has increased by 3% to $70,000, but it's grown at a slower rate compared to the previous year. When we look at the details, we see a fairly even spread of increases across income groups with the largest going to the top two. The 35 to 54 year olds got shredded here over the last three years because they saw very little or even zero wage growth once we account for inflation and exclude any stimulus 
type payments that they received. Now, here's the thing. I was looking for some additional overall trends when it comes to household income because I wanted to put today's numbers into context. I came across household income data, but it's actually from the Census Bureau. Now, as I go through these numbers, keep in mind that they do their own survey. So the numbers might be slightly different from the Fed, but directionally, these are going to be correct. Here's what I found. According to their data set, median household incomes have actually declined since the Fed did their survey three years ago. On top of that, since 1985, when the data starts, real median household incomes have only increased by about 31%. I don't know if there's a good answer for what it should be, but 31% seems pretty darn low for the past 38 years. After seeing this chart, I personally wouldn't call wage growth stagnant over the long run, but I would say that I kind of wish it was higher because I like to see people earn more money in general. As we'd expect, incomes decline during recessions because these two things go together like, I don't know, peanut butter and jelly since people lose their jobs. Side note, it always makes me laugh when I hear someone hope for a recession, which could potentially cause home prices to fall so that they can actually afford to buy one. Oh yeah, because the best time to buy a home is when you lose your job and you can't afford one. Said no one ever. Hopefully none of you watching this lose your job when the next few recessions hit, but assuming that you're one of the special ones that just won't get laid off, is a terrible strategy. A 31% increase in median household income may be low enough to bother some of you to the point where you just wanna chuck your phone at the wall. So let me paint you a rosier picture when it comes to income growth using something called the median personal income instead. While looking at the median household income is good enough, it can be a little misleading when it comes to gauging how incomes have grown over time. Economist Russ Roberts has a good YouTube video and medium post explaining why this is. At a basic level, household income numbers don't account for how the structure of households have changed over time due to marriage decline. Russ explains it through the fact that going from two adult households with two incomes to one adult household with one income will show an overall decline or even stagnation in household income. So if we want to get a better measurement of how incomes have actually done, it would make more sense to look at the real median personal income, which looks at things on an individual basis as opposed to the real median household income. According to this measurement, incomes have grown by 53% since 1984 and have been stagnant over the past few years. Now you could look at the past few years and once again get super upset about how incomes haven't really moved much. And I agree that it is not ideal, but let's not ignore the growth that we saw through 2019. We also have to remember how weird the world has been since 2020. I'd rather have flat incomes as opposed to declining incomes like we saw in 1990 and 2008 after those crises. If anything, this is a best case scenario. Instead of complaining about it, most people would be better off spending that energy on doing things to get paid more money. While we can nitpick different parts of America's finances to say why it's all gone to hell in a handbasket, overall, things aren't looking as bad as the headlines tell us, or some of you might feel. Net worth is up, income is up, and debt is down. We are the wealthiest society that has ever existed. I'm left scratching my head wondering why perception is so different from reality. Here's why I think there's such a large gap between how people actually feel versus what we would expect based on reality, especially here in the US. Housing affordability has gotta be at the top of that list. I think that we can all agree that it is a freaking mess right now. The Fed found that the median net housing values defined as the home's value minus any debt secured by the home increased 44% between 2019 and 2022 from about $139,000 to $200,000. These growth rates are the largest on record over the history of the survey. And going back to the beginning of the video, this is a huge reason that we've seen people's net worth skyrocket. If you already own, then you are feeling pretty darn good about the value of your home. And if you don't, then I guess you're a loser. Can I have a hug? Give me a hug. No way. Come here. I'm not coming over there. Let's go. Forget it. Toronto. I'm just kidding. Those of us who happen to purchase homes before prices went up just got completely lucky based on when we were born. Don't let anybody try to tell you differently. Heck, even people who own homes that want to move have to wrestle with trading their low interest rate for a higher one. Everyone is pretty much just stuck in place. All I gotta say is hopefully you don't hate your neighbors. This whole housing affordability problem we have right now has been a train wreck waiting to happen though. 
Check this out. New construction of single family homes has been extremely low. The industry has been underbuilding for way too long. It was just a matter of time until something burst to this bubble. On top of that, less smaller homes have been built over the past 23 years, which is a problem since these are perfect for first time home buyers. In 1999, homes built that were less than 1800 square feet made up 37% of new construction. Now they only make up 23%. Don't let anybody fool you. This problem isn't going anywhere anytime soon until the supply problem is fixed, specifically for single family homes. There's gonna have to be a massive home building boom and builders are going to need to be incentivized to wanna build these types of smaller homes. They're not going to wanna build something that they just don't make any money on and no one should blame them. If you think about it, you wouldn't go to work every day just to break even, would you? No. I wouldn't, and I know for a fact that you wouldn't either. This is our new reality when it comes to home affordability, and it's going to take quite a few years to fix. So buckle up and get used to it. The gap between how you feel and reality is also relative to your specific situation. If your personal finances don't match up with all of the positive stats that I just mentioned, then you probably think that I'm an out of touch psychopath and I get that. Back in the 90s when my mom was raising four kids by herself on food stamps, welfare, just barely scraping by, she'd probably say the exact same thing. <laughs> Shout out to all the deadbeat dads out there. But if we are looking at data for the overall US population, then things aren't looking as bad as they seem. What we see every day or month can have a huge impact on our thoughts and how we feel. And prices of what we spend money on is always right there, smacking us in the face everywhere we look. Food, gas, insurance, clothes, housing, milk steak. How about your favorite food? What would that be? Oh, milk steak. What? Milk steak. But it's not like inflation is some big surprise to any of us. We all know that $100 today is worth way less than it was 20 years ago. What really causes our brains to straight up short circuit is when there is a big rate of change over a short period of time. Here's what I mean. Cumulative inflation over the past three years has been about 17%. Over the previous 10 years through 2020, cumulative inflation was also 17%. We've managed to squeeze 10 years of inflation into the last three freaking years. The last three years of price increases is equivalent to you hopping in a cold shower and howling like a little six year old throwing a fit instead of hopping in a warm shower then slowly turning up the cold water. So uh, yeah, I kind of understand why things feel a lot worse in the short term over the past three years than they actually are when we look at the bigger picture. When it comes to personal finances, I also don't think it helps that humans have a natural tendency to be more pessimistic. No one says they like negative news, but somehow we still end up clicking on those articles, tweets, and watching those YouTube videos. When things are on the decline, everyone will tell you how it's gonna get so much worse. And when things are trending up, everyone will tell you why it's going to go back down. You just can't win but you still click. And once you start swimming in the cesspool of macroeconomic content, whoops, I mean doom and gloom content, it starts to make you feel a little hopeless about your current situation and the future. Steven Pinker wrote a great book called Enlightenment Now, which I highly recommend. He argues that even though pessimism is everywhere in society, insane amounts of progress has been made relating to health, lifespan, wealth, inequality, the environment, peace, safety, and democracy. Always remember that it's easy to hyper-focus on setbacks and bad things because they happen quickly, but real progress takes time to play out, which makes it a lot more difficult to predict. Go outside, touch some grass, focus on the things that you can control, hit that thumbs up button, and I promise you we are all going to be fine. I'll see you in the next one, friends. Done.